on this episode, you know what? This episode doesn't need an introduction. We're going to be interviewing Les Brown. But before we do that, I want to remind you to please subscribe and share. And if you'd like to get in deeper conversation, join my private Facebook group called Victoriously Living. And if you'd like to see more from One Leg Up Productions, you can support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Welcome to Chair Chats, the lifestyle talk show with a disability twist. I'm your host, Pauline Victoria. Today, I am so excited because on this episode, we're going to deep dive into the life and lessons of the master motivator and the voice of greatness, Mr. Les Brown. Les, thank you so much for being with us today. I wanted to start out by asking you two questions, and because I'm asking two questions, it's because I think they may be related in some way. Um, you were labeled educably retarded when you were younger. And the first question is in relation to that, what did that mean to you? And how did you move beyond the label? That's the first question. And related to that, you were known as DT, the dumb twin. And your other twin, Wesley, was known as someone who was smart. How do we handle being compared or comparing ourselves to others? Well, first of all, I didn't know what educable, mentally retarded meant. I think probably I thought it was a compliment because of big words that I didn't understand. <laughs> Sometimes you have to be intelligently ignorant. But my mother, who only had a third grade education, she said, she looked at me and said, a hard head makes a soft behind. <laughs> So she was going to get to my subconscious mind through my behind. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever it takes. <laughs> That's right. You know? So the thing that I, I think that got me through that in even being taunted and, and bullied was a feeling that my mother gave me. And she always said to me, you're special, Leslie. You're special. Even when I got in trouble and she would have to put a switch on me, she would give me ice cream and say to me, you're special. She said, I hate to whoop you. It hurts me worse than it does you. I said, no, it doesn't, Baba. <laughs> <laughs> she said, well, why don't you be good? Why do you stay out? So you had, to, at that time, you had to be home when the lights came on in the neighborhood, the, 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 the street lights. And my brother and sisters, they were always there. And mom would come out, Leslie, Leslie. Wesley would be in the house. And, then I, and when you got home and the lights were on, you are gonna get a weapon. And I remember saying to Wesley, I was crying, I said, Wesley, I said, you need to do something bad because they think I'm crazy. He said, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so he decided to be good because he didn't want to go through what I was going through. But I enjoyed playing checkers with the old men down the street. I, they said that I was an old soul. And I had a joy for life. You know, people talk about that my laughter gives them joy and they laugh at me laughing. But I was like that as a kid and it got me in trouble talking to the other students and making them laugh made me feel good and I would be punished for talking too much. Now I get paid to talk. <laughs> wow, that's, a, <laughs> what a difference. Yes, but I always enjoyed life. I, I said to a friend of mine the other day, he asked me, how you doing, man? I said, the best day of my life. He said, I, I, I know you have fourth stage cancer. Aren't, aren't you under the treatment of the Cancer Centers of America? I said, yes. 
He said, didn't they tell you to metastasize the seven areas of your body? I said, yes. I said, not only that, I said, Dr. Golson was one of the top oncologists when he first diagnosed me with cancer. He said, when I asked him, can I get a second opinion? He said, yes, and you're ugly too. <laughs> I, said, I said, you didn't just call me ugly, did you? He said, yes, but I started laughing and then he stopped, he said, you got this, you got this. We determine the diagnosis. You and God determines your prognosis. You got this. And when you laugh, the mind shuts down, but the heart opens up. When I teach and the students that I train, I teach them how to use humor strategically to get into the heart, to shut the mind down and to get into the heart. And that was major for me. And I always have felt that I have it, that I have it in me to overcome anything that life throws at me. When they were going to radiate my spinal area and I went in the bathroom and I saw an X on right under my Adam's apple. I asked the nurse, I said, why is this X here? She said, well, when they perform this procedure going in there, you know, you, you might not be able to talk tomorrow. I said, excuse me? I'm a speaker. She said, I know. She said, they didn't tell you? I said, no. Yeah. Wow. And it's and a risk. It's, yeah. So what I did, when I got in bed that night, I said, I might not be able to talk tomorrow. So I called all my kids. We had a conference call. I said, listen, I want you all to know I love you. They said that after the procedure tomorrow, I might not be able to talk again. And so I want you to know, and I talked to them each individually, and then they prayed for me. I got in the bed and I said, hmm. I took my phone out. I said, if this the last night that I'm gonna be able to talk, I'm going to give a motivational speech tonight. <laughs> and it can be found on YouTube. And I talked for an hour and a half, medical instruments going off, nurses coming in and out, giving me shots, prepping me for the procedure the next morning. And, and people watched, many cried and just said, what kind of guy is this? A friend of mine named George Frazier said, who gives a speech from his hospital bed? And people said, Les Brown, Mrs. Baby Brown's baby boy. <laughs> right. Well, and you know what? I was just listening to something you said this morning, um, and in, uh, it was a YouTube video from the past, but you've always said this, you get who you are, not what you want. And you are a speaker through and through. And so for you to be able to do that on your hospital bed, that's... <laughs> Not surprising from Les Brown, but yes. you know, you have, you have your battling cancer for, this is not the first round. You've yeah, done it 27 years. Right. 27 years. And even from your young childhood, um, for those who may not know you, you were adopted. You lived in poverty in a time when there was segregation. How do, how does someone not live from their circumstances, but into the potential of their greatness. It takes focus. I remember Sam Axelrod, who I worked for as a kid, and we were going on Miami Beach, and they had signs up that said, Jews, dogs, and coloreds, not allowed. And I got angry when I saw that. There were places on Miami Beach that dogs can go to, but I couldn't go because of the color of my skin. And Sam said something that stayed with me. He said, anger is a wind that blows out the lamp of the mind. He said, don't get angry when you see these signs. Focus on what you need to do and who you need to become 
to make it against the odds. The system is stacked against you. And so accept that reality and work and do everything you can to overcome that, to offset that with your mind, with your skills and your hunger to get a better life for yourself and for your mother. Because I, I decided that at a young age that I wanted to buy my adopted mother home. I, I feel like Abraham Lincoln, that he said, all that I am and all that I ever hoped to be, I owe to my mother, that God took me out of my biological mother's womb and placed me in the heart of my adopted mother. And she worked for these wealthy families. She cooked for them and we ate the food left over from the families that she cooked for. And she kept their children and we wore their hand-me-down clothes. And I would follow her around these big, beautiful mansions and say, Mama, what is it, Leslie? When I become a man, I'm gonna buy you a big, beautiful home just like this. And I did, I, I took care of her. She never had to pay another bill when she uh, told me that I would be a man at 18. I said, you will never pay another bill. I am a man. I set her down and mama passed when she was 89. I don't believe that women should pay bills. I'm old school. Uh, a man provides for his family. A man provides and protect. A woman, if she chooses to work, she should do that which she loves and whatever money she earns, use it for herself. But a man, not a woman, a man's supposed to pay the bills. That's not being chauvinistic, but mama used to say to me and Wesley and Leonard and Angelo, if you got a wife and she's got a job too, one of y'all got to go. <laughs> Provide for your wife. I say, yes, ma'am, mama. She, she raised gentlemen. Yes, yes. Yes. And when you say use your mind, how does one build up their mind? I did it through listening to motivational messages. First of all, looking at my mother. I used to rub her ankles. She suffered from arthritis. And she would tell me stories. And I would love these stories and say, Mama, would you tell me a story again? And she said, you asked me for the same stories, but she always told it with the same excitement. And I had no idea at that time, Paulie, that she was cultivating my mind unbeknownst to both of us to become an effective storyteller. There are some things that you, at the time they happen, you think they happen to you, but in reality, as you go into the future, they happen for you. And, and so, it, it really helped me to appreciate the value of listening to stories and being able to tell stories and use them to transform people individually and collectively. And I believe that everything that I've experienced has brought me to who I am right now. And I'm appreciative. I'm here because of God's grace and mercy. All the stuff, the good, the bad, the ugly, played a role in shaping me to become the person that I am. Mm, amen. Amen. You have a program where you are raising up the next generation of speakers because our voices have the power to destroy or to speak life into someone else. And you, of course, have spoken life into probably millions of people all around the world. What would you say to the upcoming influencers in the next generation? I think I have a gift. I have an eye. I was stalking you in a hotel lobby. <laughs> I was following you because I saw you with this phone talking and rolling around on your, the, the, the motorized wheelchair. And I said, and I got close to you and I'm hearing you conduct business. I said, she's conducting business and holding a phone on her shoulder and her chin? I said, I've got to know her and <laughs> she's unstoppable. And, and I came up to you as you recall and interrupted you. And when I heard your voice, 
I said, whoa, what a voice. And you emanate such love and compassion and caring and your eyes are hypnotic. <laughs> and I said, you ought to speak. You got a story. And I look, I believe it is my role that in this place in my life at 75. We learn, we earn, we pass it on. And February the 17th, I was asking God, what's the next place for me? What's the next move? What's the next chapter? And I believe as a lady that who flew from Australia to have me train her in how to tell my story, tell her story in Atlanta. And I stopped and said, why did you come to me? She said, I was on YouTube and I, I was thinking to myself, I've been a wife, I've been a mother, but I've never been me. I like to help people. And I saw you speaking to 80,000 people in the Georgia Dome on YouTube. And you spoke from your heart and she said, I want to speak like that. Can you teach me how to do that? I said, yes. And if you're coachable, you will pass me as I pass my mentor. And then we started working together. I was asking her key, key questions. And then I said, but what are you going to do with it? And she said, and I will never forget this. She said, I believe that the world is hateful and, and divisive and violent. She said, just a few people, not everybody, just a few people, but too many people are silent. Mm -hmm. And I want my voice to be heard, to speak light where there's darkness. And it just gave me goose pimples. Yeah, right here. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so I, I said, that's, that's the next chapter for me to to train speakers how to be messengers of hope. Since 1999 to now, the suicide rate in the United States of America, where people drown trying to get here, uh, get shot trying to get here, have dogs chasing them, separated from their children and put in cages in the United States of America, seeking another way of life, that we need messengers of hope. Because when there's hope in the future, it gives you power in the present. We are very fortunate to have been dropped off on this part of the planet. I remember being in a foreign country and I saw a bumper sticker say, Yankee, go home and take me with you. <laughs> <laughs> and so my goal is to train people from all walks of life how to use their story to make a difference. Horace Mann said we should be ashamed to die until we've made some major contribution to humankind, to make a difference and also to create financial independence. Today, because of the computer, with these 30 million people who've been laid off and even more, they have the opportunity to create their own income. The computer, it gives you access to information. You can learn anything on the computer. Time Magazine said the computer is the person of the year. Computer eliminates geography. And so you can learn anything on the computer and you can also have a global business on the computer and on your iPhone. That's exciting. Robert Shuler said something I agree with. He said, there's never a shortage of money, just a shortage of ideas. So 30 million people now have an access to use their thinking, their experiences, their knowledge, knowledge is the new currency, to create a new chapter in their lives. Right, right. And uh, if people are ready to stop being silent, what is the name of your program in which they can come under your wing? It's called Discover Your Power Voice. They can email me at lesbrown77 at gmail.com. By me listening over and over again to motivational messages, Jim Rowan, when the end comes for you, let it find you conquering a new mountain. 
not sliding down an old one. Zig Ziglar, if you give enough people what they want, they will give you what you want. Dr. Norman Vincent Peale wrote The Power of Positive Thinking. You have something special. Don't allow your negative thoughts to overpower you. I always wanted to open for him. That was one of my dreams. And I opened for him in Kankakee, Illinois. And he was sharp, even in his 90s. We were backstage and the young guy said, Dr. Peel, how old are you? He said, Sonny, I'm 92. He looked him up and down and young guy said, I don't know if I want to live to be 92. He said, that's because you've never been 91. <laughs> I love the sense of humor. Oh yeah. my gosh. And and you know what? I truly believe that having a sense of humor really does um, add years to your life, you know? And, and I am always promoting a victorious life. Like what does a victorious life look like for people? So at the end of their life, they can say, I'm a winner. I, I am a champion of, of this life. In your opinion, what do you think are one or two qualities of a life of victory? It's the, the, the hunger and the craving to live a life that will outlive you. Wow. And, and, and willing to lay it all on the line. You know, I'm gonna climb this mountain, or you're gonna find me on the side of it dead with a smile on my face something that resonates with you, something that gives your life a sense of meaning, something that becomes your magnificent obsession to leave the planet better than how you found it. Wow. If I had hands, I would clap right now. <laughs> all in my I, feel mind. You. Look, I feel you, my sister. We got a virtual hug, all oh, right? No. <laughs> Thank you so much, Les. I so appreciate you speaking life into our audience and um, just being a, that light and that voice that's no longer quiet and is a beacon of hope for everybody. Um, is there anything else that you want to let our people know about your, uh, do you have, a, you have a book? I know you have a book. Yes, yes. I have my brand new book. It's entitled, You've Got to Be Hungry. <laughs> And if they go to I am hungry less brown dot com, I am hungry less brown dot com, they can get it there. It will it, it will give them expanded vision of themselves. It will fortify their faith and, and strengthen their confidence. It will teach them the strategies on how to take their ideas and their dreams and their abilities and and and, and rob the cemetery of their gifts and dreams and begin to live a more impactful life. I remember my, I was at my desk and my daughter called me, Ona, that you know, and, and she said, are you busy now? And I said, no, I'm just at the desk working on some things. And she said, well, I'm waiting for this cop. He's in the center of the road. Obviously there's a funeral procession about to come by. And then all of a sudden I said, I heard her say, whoa, wow. And I said, what's going on, baby? She said, a hearse came by and there was only one car behind it. She said, Daddy, when I die, I want because of the kind of life that I live, that there will be a long procession of cars behind the hearse. When I die, I want the cemetery to be filled with people who come out to celebrate my life because I touch their lives. And I think that all of us, want to live that kind of life. Yes. Wow. I don't need a CA anymore. Um, I'm just going to leave it there. I want to ask you, our viewer, if you're watching this, in this short time we had with Mr. Les Brown, there was so much wisdom that was imparted. I want to know if you can comment below, what is your biggest takeaway from this? And if you can subscribe and share, if you haven't already, share this episode with as many people as you can. It will be a gift of a lifetime and who knows, it may inspire another person to no longer be silent. 
And if you'd like to join my Facebook group, you can do that. It's called Victoriously Living. And if you'd like to see more from One Leg Up Productions, you can support us at patreon.com forward slash One Leg Up Productions. Thank you so much. And until we meet again, be blessed. <laughs>